Hello, everyone. Good morning. Let's wait just a couple of minutes for people still joining, and then we'll start. All right, I think we can start. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are joining us today. My name is Yasgi Genç. I'm a graduate student at University of Utah. On behalf of on IFA Online Events Committee, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first Feminist Economics of Global Reproductive Justice series. Following the overturn of Roe v. Wade and the threats to reproductive rights globally, there become a great interest from IFE members and leadership in supporting reproductive justice movements, not in the United States, but globally. This event series will be global in scope, looking to highlight intersections with economic justice and impacts from a feminist lens. We are hoping to create a space for global feminist economics reflection, identify the ways the work of feminist economics can support the reproductive justice movements. We also have ongoing events through a number of other event tracks. So please look out for announcement about those events and see our past events on IFE's online YouTube channel. Like those past events, today's event will be recorded and posted to IFE's YouTube channel. And lastly, this is a Zoom call, not a webinar. So friendly reminder to please keep yourself muted. Without further delay, it's my honor to introduce to today's event's moderator, dear Kate Bunn. Kate Bunn is a director of labor market policy and chief economist at Washington Center for Equitable Growth. As a part of her work at Equitable Growth and in partnership with the National Partnership for Women and Families, Kate has been facilitating national level dialogues between researchers and activists to create opportunities for collaboration and create, create uh, activist informed research agendas to best support reproductive justice and rights during this critical time in the United States. Given this work, as well as her scholarship in this area, we are grateful to have her moderate today's discussion. So without a further delay, I'll leave the floor to dear Kate Bunn. Thank you so much, Yasky, um, and also thank you to the Online Events Committee for all your work organizing this event with such an exceptional group of panelists. I um, mean, thank you everyone also for joining us today. Um, as Yasky mentioned, this is the first event in a series on reproductive justice following interest from this community of feminist economists after the overturn of Roe v. Wade earlier this year. And also, as Yasgi mentioned, my work has primarily been on the US economic context, including my own research on the economic impact of abortion access. But this is really a critical moment for bodily autonomy and reproductive justice across the globe. And I, I really believe it's sort of more important than ever to bring together this group of global experts to share their knowledge. And from this, I'm hoping we can sort of learn both the differences and the similarities across the global space and in different cultural and economic contexts. And it's that place where I think we can learn and deepen our understanding of what reproductive justice really means and how it intersects with economic justice. So today's group of speakers are advocates and activists working on sexual and reproductive health and issues of bodily autonomy, but with a really nuanced understanding of the economic concept that these concepts exist. And I really think this group of economists um, will learn a lot, and I hope this leads to future collaboration between everyone. So briefly, I'll give an overview of the structure of today's event and our speakers before I hand it off to our keynote. Um, first, we'll hear from Siva Tanan Tiran, who is the executive director of ARO, a regional women's rights organization based in Malaysia. Um, Arrow strives to enable women to be equal citizens in all aspects of their life by ensuring their sexual and reproductive health and rights are achieved. Through their work in through their work centers in the Asia Pacific region, they work closely with many national partners in countries, regional, global networks around the world, and are able to reach stakeholders in 120 countries. Speaker will Siva will give us a keynote of about 15 to 20 minutes. And then following her, we'll open up to a panel with two really wonderful panelists, um, including Giselle Carino, who is the director and CEO of Fos Feminista, 
Um, FOS Feminista is a progressive and growing feminist alliance of local partner organizations that share a commitment to ensuring universal access to sexual and reproductive health care, eliminating violence against women and girls and gender diverse people, providing sex education and advancing gender and reproductive justice by dismantling structural sexism, racism, and other forms of oppression. And Giselle herself is a political scientist and activist from Argentina, a high impact leader and a truly a change maker. And then also joined will be Sachini Pereira, who is the executive director of Research. Re the members of Research are young feminists under 40 years of age, working for sexual and reproductive justice through national, regional, and international advocacy and movement building strategies in Africa, Asia, the Pacific, Latin America, and Europe. Sachini is a queer feminist from Sri Lanka who has worked in communications and advocacy with local, regional, and global feminist and women's rights organizations for the last 14 years. She's also the co-creator of Delete Nothing, a trilingual platform to systematically document online gender-based violence in Sri Lanka and help survivors find support. So I will moderate the conversation with the panelists with a few fundamental questions to get the conversation going. We'll have a conversation for about 30 minutes or so following Siva's keynote, and then we'll open it up to our audience because you all are also experts yourself to participate in a Q&A. Um, and the way we'll do that, and I'll remind you when we get there as well, is please raise your hand and I can call on people to chime in. If you have something that is more of a comment than a question, we welcome those, but I encourage you instead to drop that in the chat rather than asking it as a question. And you're also welcome to drop a question in the chat too, if you'd prefer me to read it out loud. Um, with that, thank you again to all of our attendees and to our speakers and welcome to Steva. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, and uh, thank you for this invitation because I feel like deeply honored to be able to address this group. Um, I wanted to actually on the overall say that, uh, you know, neither am I an economist, uh, nor do I uh, kind of profess uh, to be a justice expert. Uh, but um, over the past two years, uh, due to the inequalities and the deepening inequalities that exist in the world, I think there was a fundamental need even for us as a sexual and reproductive rights organization to actually explore the concept of justice and what it meant to uh, um, our partners as well as the communities in uh, our part of the world, right? Uh, and I think that these are some of the learnings and you know insight that we have gathered. And I also look forward to like learning from everyone here to kind of sharpen my own understanding. Uh, so next slide, please. Yeah, so... Um, why move from reproductive rights to reproductive justice? And this was a kind of a political discussion um, that we had. Uh, and I was asked definitely by even our own partners, you know, we can't even realize reproductive rights. Uh, why are we moving to something bigger, right? Uh, and I think it's precisely because we can't achieve reproductive rights, we need to uh, move to that reproductive justice framework. So rights as understood, you know, are like legal social principles of freedoms and entitlements, right? Rights are understood as normative rules of what is allowed of people, what is owed to people according to the legal system, social in convention, ethical theory, or in theocratic states, uh, which some of us are increasingly living in, religious texts, right, and interpretations of religious texts. Historically, the concept of legal rights has been checkered you know, uh, because uh, in allowing all citizens in being able to achieve equality. So the legal framework itself actually replicates the power structures and the power biases which are within our own society, you know, men over women, majority populations over minorities, whether these are racial, ethnic, religious minorities, age and ability over aged and disabled, and citizens over migrants, right? Within the development discourse, Thus far in the last 20 years or so, we have focused primarily on the concepts of liberty and equality and about endowing, recognizing, awakening marginalized groups with their rights and that these groups are then able to challenge these power structures held by dominant groups and achieve the outcomes that are desired. Right. So this has been our thinking in the past. But in more recent times, economics and politics have seen you know, a division in the understanding of equality, the equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome, right? Which shows the gaps uh, in our understanding of what rights are meant to achieve, you know? Uh, next slide. 
So the reproductive is a quote from Kimala Price, uh, and um, this is uh, as part of like later on when you see, um, you know, Arrow recently commissioned uh, Deepika Jain from the JNU to kind of look at uh, uh, access to safe abortion and decriminalization in advocating for access to safe abortion across the, the 10 states, right? And the work of Kimala is often uh, quoted inside this uh, study that we've done, uh, commissioned. So the reproductive justice framework recognizes the importance of it linking reproductive health and rights to other social justice issues such as poverty, economic injustice, welfare reform, housing, prisoners' rights, environmental justice, immigration policy, drug policies, and violence. So it calls us to uh, look at agency and reconsider agency within the broader system of relational power. And we also have to look at you know, what is legitimate decision making? Who can make decisions over what kind of matters, right? So, and who is a, seen as a legitimate decision maker within our societies? Uh, next uh, slide. So, and I think like, you know, if I really wanted to simplify it, you know, to understand, it's like, uh, we can uh, try to answer the question, who is able to access what type of service? Why is this so? What structural limitations exist, right? And this question helps us uh, unpack and interrogate some of the power and privilege and helps us understand marginalization better. You know, uh, next slide. Yeah. So one was the decriminalization aspect of what we feel reproductive justice is about. And this is, you know, talks about the limits of legalization uh, and it is uh, covered. I mean, the final edition is forthcoming in 2023. It's been a long work and looks at decriminalization of abortion services across 10 Asian countries. Uh, next, so the findings from this uh, on this topic are from that. So the next slide, please. So the decrim approach, you know, looks at how criminalization of groups and behaviors actually kind of limit their ability to realize their reproductive rights. Um, and uh, we can look at things uh, and definitely amongst the study has looked at young people, age of consent, legal age of marriage, marital status become preconditions for accessing services legitimately, whether it's contraception, abortion, with sanctions, sometimes legal on those who should not, like for example, uh, even if it was consensual sex amongst minors, then you know it is seen as statutory rape uh, and may not actually be able to you know, uh, um, access a safe abortion service, so it becomes forced pregnancy as well. Right. Um, secondly, we can we can think of migrant workers who are discriminated on basis of pregnancy, not able to access reproductive health services, including birthing services, or uh, migrant workers who are also kind of uh, discriminated against HIV status. You know, and both of this kind of uh, how do I say uh, sanction them from actually holding legal uh, uh, permits for work. Um, one of the groups, and uh, this came up consistently across different countries, were trans men. You know, services for women, married, heteroman, normative uh, persons did not recognize rape and pregnant, forced pregnancy of trans men and let them out of services. And hence, uh, you know, the heteronormative familial basis for legitimate, who is the legitimate uh, uh, decision maker over uh, their bodies is, also needs to be interrogated. Of course, with uh, regards abortion, you know, gestation limits of whether it's 16 weeks, 20 weeks, or sometimes, you know, surprisingly in my region in, this, in Indonesia, uh, the limits are at six weeks, <laughs> you know, which, and, and, you know, it's written as though it was a great reform, but, you know, most people don't even realize uh, they're pregnant at six weeks, right? Um, and of course, you have either marital status as a barrier, age, third party, and sometimes coming to third party validation for mental health and rape, right? So these are, so decriminalization is, um, uh, is an approach which says that just the reproductive rights framework is not adequate. And we need to look at decriminalization in order to enable access to uh, these critical groups which are marginalized from services. Uh, next slide. Ah, okay, uh, even though we are here, I, clear, I also wanted to talk about uh, people uh, people with disabilities, right? So uh, very often people with disabilities are also not seen as legitimate decision makers or have full agency over the choices uh, that they make around their sexuality or their reproductive uh, health and re reproductive rights. So um, that's also one of the aspects of the decrim. Um, uh, the second is the equity approach, right, which talks about the limit of rights. So the equity, uh, next slide, please. 
in the equity approach, um, in the uh, limitations and gaps in access and outcomes, right, um, shows us the limitations of the rights approach. So if we look at data sets across all countries, we can see that women who are poorer, less educated, living in rural or hard to reach areas have less access to contraception and all other SRH services and are more likely uh, to die in childbirth. So inequalities in life equals to inequities in life. Inequalities are structural and embedded in legal institutional framework. Uh, the equity approach also asks us to consider that not one size fits all. So marginalized groups may require more than one intervention or non-conventional interventions in order to have similar outcomes. So equity to quality service is also a, a, a critical thing, right? Because in reproductive health, for example, women who receive contraceptive services, for example, IUD insertions, you know, from the poorest communities, they may be realizing some aspect of their reproductive rights, but the service that they are receiving are actually unsanitary, without privacy, in camp setting, no counseling, and no information on side effects, right? So we have to look at that this quality service is something that is equitable across all groups. Um, next slide, please. Another aspect of uh, equity approach that, you know, we may have to consider with regards to the reproductive justice framework is that, you know, marginalization and vulnerability also mean that women in public spaces face violence, right? So reducing violence, enabling women to access safe spaces for themselves and their children, access to legal recourse, also part of a reproductive justice framework. Um, and this is also true of uh, when we look at the intersections with um, economic justice, violence at the workplace, uh, sexual harassment, assault, rape, replicate violence within uh, social structures, and ensuring compliance and access to recourse is essential, right? Including ensuring survivors' confidentiality safety and non-retaliation by uh, the organizations and companies, right? Uh, so ensuring access to services for survivors, including reproductive health services, abortion and HIV prophylaxis also comes to mind. Um, next slide. And then the third, which we need to consider is the care approach or what is considered women's work, right? Um, next slide. Um, the care approach uh, in reproductive justice asks us to uh, be cognizant of not only the productive labor, but also the reproductive labor. Uh, this involves parenting and raising children in a safe environment. Uh, in this calls for access to quality childcare, ability to care for family and work at the same time, having safe schools, but also very interestingly in a very traditional safe space like the ICFP it came up, access to IVF as an essential part, right? Recognition not only of care work performed by women in the formal sector, but also care work performed by women in the informal sector, right? Caregiving to children, disabled and elderly, performed by caregivers and the, their health, their mental health and the rights and entitlements that are due to them uh, are, are also critical. Uh, next slide. And then one of the things that uh, we, I thought was also useful for economists is a fragile context approach, right? So compounding vulnerabilities. Uh, next slide. Um, and where I wanted to look at two uh, different scenarios. One is, of course, about uh, climate change. So as an uh, extension of both equity and care approaches, we have to consider some of the most vulnerable groups. Uh, maps of poverty are closely aligned with maps of climate change vulnerability, you know, such as coastal areas, low-lying flood-prone areas, and drought-prone lands are inhabited by some of the poorest and most marginalized communities where climate change renews the cycle of poverty and deprivation, especially for women, right? Because the loss of assets and uh, during the time, you know, and livelihoods during that time affect women the most. Um, in addition to that, there is the burden of care work, gendered roles, threat of violence, and lack of access to services, right? So the reproductive justice uh, framework calls us to delve into, you know, aspects of safe re relocation, access to land and shelter, safety and security for family and children. Um, and ability to recreate a family life again uh, become uh, uh, kind of the hallmarks. The gender and climate change uh, uh, arena needs to be funded to ensure a more level playing field for women at the community level. The next slide actually is about uh, women in conflict and post-conflict societies actually face even worse challenges, you know, war and high levels of destruction, burden of care work, and against the same thing, right, threat of violence, provision of services, and rebuilding of infrastructure 
safe relocation and uh, access to refugees, access to land and shelter, safety and security of children and families, and ability to recreate a family life. So gender in post-conflict needs to be emphasized in foreign policy and age and agendas and be included as part of the macroeconomic agenda, right? So that rebuilding of economies with gender at the heart. And this is from Olmsted and Killian, which is forthcoming in review of radical political economics. Then the next uh, slide. So what are some of the possible intersections of reproductive justice with economic justice, right? Uh, and this is a you know, definition of e economic justice from CESJ. And of course, the three elements of economic justice that need to be considered, no particip participative, which is input, redistributive, outtake, as well as social or corrective, reconciliatory. And these are choices for both microeconomic and macroeconomic policy. Uh, next slide, please. And what are some economic justice pathways? I know that uh, sometimes when you look at uh, uh, the world out there, uh, a lot of economic justice uh, measures are focused on women's entrepreneurship, which is overemphasized as a single intervention, though it enables economic opportunity and freedoms of certain groups of women and enables access to credit and financing, which are, which are important. But the other sector is women's workers' rights. So both in informal and formal sector, access to paid leave, health services, non-discrimination based on gender is something that we also need to like kind of uh, strengthen, you know. And the third, of course, is the care economy, right? So uh, women who are in situations who are not able to become entrepreneurs or women workers, but because by circumstances they are supposed to care for children, disabled, elderly have to be compensated, you know, and provided with some form of social uh, security. And um, this is for all tasks uh, that hold families and communities together, you know, and uh, are, you know, invisibilized and not only uh, and not compensated for in any way, right? So I think that um, these are the three kind of, I mean, in my limited understanding, these are probably the three pillars that hold up what economic justice looks like. Um, the next uh, slide. So I just try to put together some of this, like, for example, how do we combine reproductive justice in a participative justice manner, right? So we have to have like, you know, the decriminalized approach, you know, it talks about reducing barriers um, uh, for women accessing SRH services and understanding that, you know, abortion services in particular may be essential for those women who live far away or hard to reach areas who are in particular, who may not get, you know, who may, where the gestational limits will limit their access, right? Um, and also ensure, you know, adolescents, uh, young people, because data shows us that um, across all countries uh, within the DHS, you can see that unintended pregnancies are highest amongst the 15 to 19 and the 20 to 24 group, right? So these are the ones who didn't, who wanted to have a pregnancy later or did not want to have a pregnancy at all. So the highest numbers come in this category. So in which case, again, you know, access uh, to abortion is a vital and critical service. Um, a decriminalized approach also may mean like in uh, participative, so uh, ensure pregnant teenagers stay in school and are able to participate in education and, um, and migrant workers, sexual and reproductive health, you know, enables them to participate. Um, the equity approach uh, is about, you know, uh, in ensuring equitable, inclusive health services and access to SRHR services as an essential part of economic justice to women workers, right? So, uh, um, and then the care approach uh, in participative is provision of childcare facilities, flexible work options, paid maternity leave, and for informal workers as even care workers. Um, the next slide, please. Some examples of distributive justice that we have seen are like, you know, a decriminalized uh, approach may mean like free clinics, quality services and counseling, especially for marginalized group. Uh, and these can be, you know, LGBT groups or, you know, sex workers or young people and adolescents who are left out of uh, the legal frameworks, right? There's also like um, in distributive justice, we can think of, you know, SMA groups, which is uh, self-managed abortion groups, which are flourishing in their community-based interventions. And that becomes a way of distributing both power and, um, and resources to the community level as being held by more, you know, in a very medical and uh, institutional settings like uh, hospitals, right? Uh, and then, of course, funding of necessary and additional services and interventions needed for marginalized groups is also one way of distributing resources. 
Um, the equity uh, approach, uh, uh, one way is of looking at, you know, ensuring access as part of workers' rights, compensation and benefits, paid maternity leave by employers and the state, which is, again, about taking tax money and being able to distribute it again uh, for uh, uh, groups. Um, and then, of course, care approach, recognition and compensation for care work, you know. Um, next slide. And some examples of, you know, social or corrective. I mean, decrim, uh, we view decrim as a sort of a corrective measure in itself. Uh, but in an equity uh, approach, you know, uh, how can we actually do corrective measures, right? So whether it is programs and policies for inclusion, so uh, for those most affected by legal barriers by early marriage or forced pregnancy or early pregnancy, or even whether it's about safe spaces for raising children, which um, requires more collective interventions, you know, and access to food, water, and shelter for most affected, because um, we do understand that, you know, uh, uh, the way that the world is uh, food, water, shelter are increasingly privatized, you know, instead of socialized, right? So that social corrective measure would be to like, you know, ensure um, right to access uh, these um, uh, things for all, right? And then care approach, I mean, social corrective uh, approach could be like reparations for women. And we've seen this with, let's say, comfort women in the past, right? Of course, that was a more of a sexual violence um, angle, but nevertheless, that um, there could be reparations for groups of women who have been uh, um, kind of, uh, yeah, trodden over and, you know, viola violated to a level that we cannot, um, you know, even begin to comprehend. So the next uh, slide. Yeah, so what are some of the ways forward? I mean, I think definitely, you know, we say we want to reset, but, you know, uh, we don't want to reset. We want to rebuild, I think, that visioning exercise, but that visioning exercise, which is more inclusive, right, I think is one of the things we need to do. And I think theorizing, because making our theories more robust, uh, nuanced, and intersectional, revising our theorizing is also uh, called for. Um, and of course, measuring, right? You know, so indicators of success. So how do we change the indicators to reflect some of these justice approaches that we are looking at? Because what gets measured is what gets funded. Then of course, linking and learning, I think is especially important in the global South uh, regions because uh, exchange of knowledge and insight across countries and regions um, is really uh, something where, you know, where we get all of the different pieces that can come together to kind of, build that holistic picture because not one person or agency or organization has the solution, right? Um, next uh, slide, please. Yeah, so it used to be uh, previously we thought about moving from the margin to the center, but uh, today I think the call for justice is to kind of implode the center or you know, explode the center and to understand that it's the center is actually the center of oppression, right? Because that's what the center actually means, you know? So uh, how do we actually spread what's in the center, the power that is in the center to the margins is the vision that we are kind of looking at more. Um, next uh, slide. Oh, I think that's thanks. Yes, did I keep time properly? Was that adequate? Yeah, thank you. You were perfect on time, really like remarkable keeping to the time schedule. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, that was really an a incredible overview. Um, and I want to sort of give a chance for our other panelists to come in um, and sort of share their information on a similar line of thinking. So um, I want to talk through in particular, I know that, you know, abortion is a critical topic here, but more broadly speaking, um, how do you conceptualize bodily autonomy as an economic issue? And in particular, sort of what is the relationship when we think about bodily autonomy as an economic issue? Um, what does it mean to make abortion an economic issue? How does that place within this broader context of bodily autonomy as an economic issue? Um, so I want with that, I will first go to Giselle and you'll have about five to seven minutes to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for inviting us to this conversation. It's not the usual conversation. So I'm, I'm very pleased and I hope it's the first and not the last and we can uh, continue thinking through the things we can do together. Uh, what can I say to follow Siva? What a privilege, my goodness. I think she covered most of what I wanted to say. I think for us, it's very clear that you know bodily autonomy is shaped uh, by access to power and resources included, but not limited to, to money. 
and those resources in our very high, highly unequal societies are concentrated on, on the hands of few, right? So I think that the, it's interesting that you put the notion of economic justice. Um, we, we, you know, mo most of my work uh, before uh, doing global work was focused on Latin America and the Caribbean, and we talked uh, as social justice, as a value that is absolutely central to sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, so we need, you know, we need money and resources to, to, to provide for, for our needs. And uh, our bodily autonomy is under threat because uh, we don't have access to what we need uh, to live with dignity, because we experience coercion or violence uh, of any kind and can't oftentimes make our own decisions on, on sexual and reproductive lives. Uh, we know that our ability to study, to work, to earn an income, to earn a promotion, to provide for ourselves and our, our lo loved ones is, is limited, right? Uh, is hindered. Um, and we also know, um, for those of us who come from middle-income countries, we know that averages uh, mask huge inequalities. And we also know that uh, restrictions uh, to sexual and reproductive health and rights are not, do not have the same impact uh, across the board, right? And that is not uh, coincidental. So that's why we talk about, and I think Siva covered this very well, of intersecting systems of oppression, patriarchy, racism, and colonialism as systems that oppress us all, but particularly uh, women, girls, and gender diverse people. Uh, this has a lot of implications for, for our work, right? We uh, support uh, frontlining organizations, organizations that are part of the feminist movement. We believe the feminist movement is perhaps the most transformative movement, uh, not only to, to make change, but to resist in the most authoritarian places. There is plenty of evidence of that. And so what we try to do is to focus and to center our work and elevate the voices uh, on, on these uh, women, uh, girls, and gender diverse people who experience what we call uh, intersecting forms of discrimination. In other words, if you are, you know, if you are uh, young, if you are black or brown, if you are indigenous, if you have disabilities, if you have all of it, um, the way you experience uh, sexual and reproductive health and right outcomes is completely different. The way you experience uh, 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 access independently of the status of the law. And here to respond directly to your question about abortion, we have known for, for many years, and that's why the notion of social justice has been so central to our fights um, in the green wave that transforms law and policies on abortion and access in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, is that you know, women who have uh, the means will always have access to a safe abortion anywhere in the world. Uh, those who don't, um, don't. And, that's independently of the law. Of course, laws and policies are important and we are very happy when we make progress and you know, we fight so hard to have laws and policies in place, but we also, I can talk to you about many places where law and policies exist and access is uh, very limited for, for these people, for people who are black, brown, indigenous, young, younger, <laughs> um, rural, you know. Um, so I think that's what, what it means concretely to us, and that's where we try to center our work, to elevate those voices, to support those organizations that are led by, by these folks, um, because they are the proof that uh, until access has not reached them, uh, our efforts are not, uh, are not, we are not there yet, right? Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Tazel and Sachini for the same question of how do you conceptualize bodily autonomy as an economic issue and, and what is the what does abortion mean within that? Thank you, Kate. And uh, hi, Siva and Giselle, and hello everyone. Very glad to be here. Um, and um, I think coming in third means I have even less things to say, I would say to begin with, but maybe we can then dive deeper. But um, I'll talk a little bit about research and uh, approach. So realizing sexual and reproductive justice or research, the uh, Global South Feminist Alliance that I'm representing here. Uh, so research from the outset itself, when, uh, when the collective came together around uh, 2010, we were already come in there with a justice approach because by working in sexual and reproductive rights over the years uh, on sexual and reproductive health also over the years we had noticed that a lot of the time 
the rights discourse tends to exist in a vacuum and you know doesn't go into some of the structural inequalities that really determine how your rights might be violated or how your rights might be realized and so our approach to um, sexual and reproductive justice then is that you know that we should have the means the tools and the know-how to freely make decisions and choices about our bodies about our reproduction our sexuality and pleasure and to this end we have spent a lot of time looking at these interlinkages of economic justice and environmental justice when it comes to sexual and reproductive rights and um one example i'll share and i think a big part of this is also building the evidence around this because a lot of the time the the data or the way we conceptualize this tends to be very siloed whereas it is very messy when we are trying to talk about all these interlinkages so how do we show that complexity and then for us the other important piece was that when we come to these policy spaces where the discussions happen uh, especially in the global spaces but also in the regional and national spaces again the complexity of the issues we work on tends to get siloed and then you're talking about issues in you know like halfway uh, ways and um so part of this approach has been to really walk into these you know halls of power and say no actually we want to talk about economics when we talk about sexual and reproductive rights because otherwise you know we can't talk about abortion or contraception for an example without really considering this aspect um so our lived realities is a storytelling project that we have been doing and we have two stories so far in there which have been you know, one from nigeria um which was actually by uh, kemi uh from uh, who is now with fos so connections here but um so kemi did this uh story about you know like how um land food and bodies are connected and you know like how the pastoral communities in nigeria how the fight for land means you know like and the kind of ripple effects that can have on the ways that you know like young people have access to education to uh, sexuality education to uh, sexual and reproductive services um and then we also had a member from lebanon work uh, with migrant workers in lebanon to again talk about you know how do economic conditions but also this you know like being in this uh, liminal place of being a migrant affect their access to services um and then the other big approach we um, also use is you know we call it beyond criminalization and um what it really refers to is going beyond criminal justice because criminal justice is also very much connected to economic justice because if we look at criminal laws in our countries where does you know accountability ever happen it is when the perpetrators or whoever who is you know like under uh, coming under the fire of the law is either from a lower class who is from a working class uh, to uh, to the lower castes uh, so we see this in manifesting in different ways according to our context and really what we have been doing is you know like trying to unpack this a bit to say we as se sexual and reproductive rights uh, activists when we are asking for criminal laws as a response to rights violations what are we perpetuating um and what kind of system are we enabling because we know the prison industrial complex and incarceration the state puts so much money into it it gets privatized it becomes a revenue of uh, income revenue for um uh, for the state and then are we also then uh, uh contributing to this and for an example if we look at uh, something like female genital uh, mutilation we always talk talk about the rights violation we talk about the cultural aspect but what about the economic aspects of this uh if marriage ability is intrinsically connected to uh fgm in your context then how do you like have that conversation with families with with even the young women or young girls themselves to be able to you know like conceptualize this within their material realities um and similar to you know like child and early marriage if our initial response is to criminalize the families for one you know we are not considering the impact that climate crisis or 
economic conditions may have in driving those rights violations. But at the same time, we are creating a second cycle of uh, these uh, violations and economic uh, precarity when we send, let's say, the father of a family or the mother into prison and like, you know, the, the cycle repeats. So how do we really talk about the effectiveness of laws by also looking at the economic conditions? Um, and then um, I think later we can talk about this a bit more, but uh, I think the social reproduction piece and the unpaid care work, because for the longest time, we've seen the spaces of production and reproduction be separated, but also, especially with the pandemic, we see this overlapping. And in both of these scenarios, we see that uh, if that work is not given a value, it doesn't get recognized, it doesn't shift cultural norms. So I think valuation is not really about identifying more workers for the workforce. It's really about trying to shift norms. And then also, I think, um, to recognize that the ways we operate, like, you know, like neoliberal individualism has really, like, you know, done a number of, on us and, you know, really taken away these ideas about community, about, like, the larger families, our chosen families for us as queer people, uh, for the working class people, like, you know, the way families conceptualized can be very different and we don't see those embedded in you know the way work is conceptualized or the way population policies are so there is also a need to really shift that heteronormative uh, framing and uh, understand like and i think this is a big role economics can play as well in you know really taking away that framing so that more people and more ways of living and more realities can be included within that I think for Roe versus Wade, I heard uh, both Siva and Giselle cover a lot of it. And I think the one thing I would add is that abortion has always existed, whether it's criminalized or not, right? Like I live in a country where it's criminalized for most part, but it exists. But then the other parts here are, you know, like what about demedicalized and depathological forms of uh, like, not just abortion, but even for gender transition and where do these fit in in this conversation and Roe v. Wade like you know as much as there's global you know like focus on it it was always about the right to privacy it's not about the bot like about bodily autonomy so it's probably time for that kind of a disruption to happen as well because it's really not being framed in the like the more broader way that it really could be um, and I think then also they are really thinking about how mutual aid, collective care, all of that comes into play when you're looking at self-managed abortion, for an example, or when you look at how a community can support someone through that. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to just stop there. That's a mishmash of different things, but um, happy to talk more. And thank you, Nana, for sharing some links. Um, that was really, really great and helpful. And and you all really demonstrated I mean, it is such a complex, nuanced thing. I mean, going through different cultural contexts, different countries, different locations, different economies, what that means. Um, but I sort of want to think about this group of people who are here listening to you all, are researchers trained to figure out, you know, what research can they be doing that is helpful and informative to this? Um, and I think a sort of core question, um, this is the question I ask when I am doing these conversations in the U.S. context as well, is sort of how do you, how does your organization um, define what priorities you have in the current moment um, and how is this shaped by sort of the particular global context that you work in. And so it, it is so complex, um, but also we need priorities. Um, and in particular, I, I think research that is geared towards those priorities would be most effective. Um, so I'd love to sort of hear if you, if you could think of priorities, if they're explicit or even just sort of context on how you decide those priorities. Um, and I will move back to Siva. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I think that um, on, on um, you know, uh, research priorities that could be um, valuable and interesting is actually, I mean, if we look at the interconnections of climate change, right? And I think that there's a lot of estimation um, around uh, loss of assets and livelihoods. And, you know, I think in Sachini's example, I mean, she talked about the story of the pastoral community, right? Um, so traditionally it has been like, you know, women from those uh, uh, marginalized communities are, who are actually very dependent, you know, uh, on, um, you know, either nature, 
right, uh, for uh, getting the kind of resources that they need. And hence, that's how, you know, that loss of assets and livelihoods is not actually regarded as loss of assets and livelihoods to, let's say, the majoritarian, I mean, like the central, the centralized uh, population, right, of elites. Um, and, and hence, uh, that loss uh, that is occurring during climate change is not adequately kind of estimated. Right. Uh, and I think that that's something that, you know, is something that uh, needs to be more closely looked at. Um, the second, of course, is that triple burden of care work. And I think that if we started like, you know, either compensating for care work, either in cash or in kind in some manner, you know, it kind of shifts the focus and it kind of uh, provides a greater circle of um, how do I say, inclusivity, you know, and participation. And um, I think that there's already work uh, being done in that, but the work kind of doesn't kind of get translated into policies, right? I mean, because we've been talking about care work for almost like one decade or two decades. I think that uh, in looking at the pandemic, you know, I mean, we should have thought that, you know, uh, although there are some governments emphasize on the transition to the green economy, uh, I would have thought that a transition to the care economy would have been like far more graceful, but uh, it just has not occurred. Uh, and I think that the push for that would uh, really be, you know, transformative in so many different ways. Great, thank you. Um, and Giselle. Um... Yes, I kind of want to answer your question and also respond to an earlier <laughs> thought that I had. As I was trying to think through examples, like very concrete examples, you know, um, I think of the situation of, of the US and the situation, how the situation in the US impacts uh, the rest of the world, right? the ripple effect on, on countries that have advanced on abortion rights. And I mean I, I mean the, the removal, the revocation of Roy versus Wade um, this year. And, and I was uh, trying to think about, you know, I see here um, Janet Rogers who studied the global gag rule. The, the global gag rule is the best example of how um, both these intersecting systems of colonialism, racism and patriarchy work in a policy, in this case, US foreign policy in relationship to sexual and reproductive health and right to oppress people. Um, and, uh, and I think your work there, your research there has been absolutely instrumental, you know, uh, research showing that, uh, for instance, women in Latin America have uh, had um, uh, worse health outcomes, uh, three more chances to actually have had an unsafe abortion because of the global gag rule has been instrumental. Uh, and I think in, in linking to your research question, I think the, one of the most difficulties we have generally is to, uh, to put women, girls, and gender diverse people uh, at the center of major agendas. You know, we, Our issues tend to be seen as marginal issues, period. And so this, this is from global emergencies to humanitarian uh, responses to climate justice. And I was trying to think through this when, when we you know, now everybody forgot about uh, the Zika epidemic, but we did a lot of work in, <clears throat> in everywhere, but particularly in Brazil, which was the epicenter. And that's that's a perfect example. Women who were uh, more prone, who live without access to clean water, were more prone to be, uh, to experience the effect of Zika. And uh, those were precisely the ones who live in conditions of more vulnerability to climate change. and. Uh, and so, and those were the ones who had the least access to uh, sex education, access to contraception, access to emergency contraception, and then access to safe and legal abortion, right? So I think, I think uh, there, there is a lot of work to be done to explore. I think in the context of, uh, of global emergencies, I, coming out, coming out, coming out, because we have the privilege of, of uh, COVID, it was very clear, Latin America and the Caribbean went back 30 years in progress on women's rights, sexual and reproductive health and rights during the COVID pandemic. If that's not uh, something to be explored and unpacked together, and this is, it's both, it's really an invitation to, so that we can think together how we uh, respond for our um, collective survival to the next uh, pandemic uh, as we try to address the ongoing issues that uh, the pandemic has created. Um, coming from a country that has done a lot of work on the care economy, I, I look at that with a huge potential. 
if we get it right, you know, if we get it right, I, I want to be very clear when I say if we get it right, is if we are comprehensive enough to include abortion care as well as part of those care agendas, right? Um, I think there is a huge potential there to, to be unpacked uh, and, and I look forward to working with anyone who's willing to tackle any of those questions. Great, thank you. Um, and Sachini, I'll also ask you the same question about establishing priorities. Yeah, sure. Um, so we have been recently talking a lot about the IMF. Uh, well, I'm from Sri Lanka, so you know why I'm thinking about the IMF, but also we've realized so many of our countries are, you know, like have the IMF and bailout as an inevit inevitability. Like, I mean, Argentina, you know what I'm talking about as well. Um, so one of the things we've been really thinking about is about putting bodies back in this conversation and how our bodies, our health and well-being are affected um, by these programs, by austerity measures, and really like, you know, starting to talk about uh, an economic crisis or a debt crisis in terms of people and our well-being, because um, we see that this conversation is, you know, always gets limited to numbers and to uh, to a certain kind of economics, but also like, you know, how do we expand this into a more like, you know, like a political economic or socioeconomic uh, understanding of this. So in terms of this, you know, what gets deprioritized uh, during austerity measures, uh, what gets privatized, um, what is the impact on our bodies and really like, you know, trying to understand that um, because what we've seen in that conversation when we talk about uh, 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 international financial institutions, for an example, is that, you know, like there is a hierarchy in who can comment on it and who can actually uh, be an authority on it without really like considering what what did what impact it has on the lived realities and i would connect this also to the universal health coverage conversation which is you know also supposed to gain some more ground uh, especially next year so how do we also you know like look at public health in the context of austerity in the context of bailouts and uh, and i don't know whether that also like especially from uh, the countries who are really going through this right now we need evidence to be able to talk about it and we don't really see enough of it uh, right now and then another piece is really you know when we talk about universal health coverage or universal social protection um, again, you know, like about this, the colonial order of the Bretton Woods institutions, right? And the kind of like the original, like, you know, ways that these institutions came about. And we see like, you know, like for an example, you know, like the, what, you know, Mia Motley has been saying at the UN uh, uh, from the Barbados about, you know, like uh, really challenging the coloniality of these institutions and talking about debt justice, for an example, um, and about debt cancellation. So how do we connect those also to this uh, universal health coverage and social protection conversation? Because they are, very much uh, intertwined. Um, and I think that cancellation particularly is a conversation we don't hear enough. Uh, this year, I was at the high level political forum on sustainable development. No one uh, except for maybe one person actually spoke about debt cancellation. Everyone kind of, you know, circles around this, but we need again uh, more research around this to for us to be able to do advocacy that is really backed up by evidence uh, around this. And I think around climate and the economy, but also trade. Um, some of the things we've been, you know, hearing uh, like you know, like about gender bonds, around green bonds, um, and again, you know, these being promoted as solutions and. It connects to a very specific, like you know, conceptualization of feminism as well, right? And uh, a very you know neoliberal conceptualization. So again, we need more evidence in order to challenge these kinds of solutions uh, as climate justice. And I think there is a role uh, for economics research also to uh, play there. Thanks. Great, thank you, Satini. And you kind of scooped my next question of where I wanted to go. Um, 
but but I will still keep going this direction um, because I think all three of you have really said things that I think you know feminist economists are already particularly attuned to, um, including you know you you talked about the difference between productive and reproductive labor, um, which is a concept that truly like feminist economics has been a forefront at conceptualizing these concepts. Um, you talked about sort of marginalization and talked about topics of intersectionality um, and focusing on um, you know those groups that have the uh, the least and and I think it was Giselle who said something around like unless those groups have full access we have not succeeded in the mission of reproductive justice um you'd said something sort of along those lines and of course the tricky thing for economists is that our data and our methodologies are like not they're already stacked against us in terms of addressing these issues because if we don't have data we don't have great data on unpaid uh care work we don't have great data on if there's a small marginalized group um so for example, I work in the U.S. context, there is a dearth of data on indigenous populations in the U.S. It's a small group, but also there's not people with the cultural context um, to be able to do that data collection. Um, and so this is, I think, a key place that this group of economists um, can play a role. And so I think this, this will be the last question before I opened it to Q&A. Um, but what role can economists and economic research play in this? And so this might be circling around stuff you've already said, but just to really make that clear for this audience that what role do you all see um, of economists and economic research in supporting your efforts in sort of supporting those priorities that you had identified? Um, and I will go in reverse order this time. I know I just, uh, Sachini just spoke, but I will go to Sachini, Giselle, and then Siva for the last round. Sure. Um, I think I'll keep this one really short because I, I, I know I referred to a bunch of this earlier, but I guess um, we keep coming back to, and I think this also happens, like I know, like Siva started saying, you know, I'm not an economist. And I think I also preface this, like, you know, like I use this as a qualifier sometimes, but at the same time, I think just living in the current economic crisis has really like also brought home that we should all be talking about this and that you know like these hierarchies are really not helping us because then the kind of like the more nuanced analysis that we can present you know like might get missed and and i think here where what i'm kind of, kind of trying to come to is how do we also like not just stay in like you know like these different lanes but really truly come together to collaborate. So, you know, don't just interview us, co-author with us, right? Like, uh, so, um, and I think really challenge these hierarchies of knowledge also. Um, I've been watching with interest how many activists, like feminist activists have been collective, uh, like collectively coming together around the economic crisis here and, you know, like uh, bringing together uh, uh, reading groups or bringing together uh, uh, like economic justice collectives, uh, barefoot economists, like feminist barefoot economists uh, in different uh, regions who have been really like, you know, coming up and trying to like, you know, shape the conversation. But we need a lot more of that, you know, to happen, like, you know, where the academics or the uh, practitioners really like continue to talk to activists and advocates as well. So I think um, that's my uh, main uh, takeaway. And then what I said earlier about putting our bodies back into this conversation and then really challenging the heteronormative uh, frameworks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And Giselle, um, what role do, do economists play? Yes, no, as you, you can see, I'm very excited about the possibilities of us uh, doing things together. I, I think as we um, engage, uh, I think you, you said, you know, we don't we don't have enough data and we feel like, oh, my goodness, we have so much data. <laughs> we just we need to see how how we use it better. And and I know you're looking for hard data and we know the limitations of that, but the limitations that we have in oftentimes uh, collecting that. But um, the lived, um, lived, the lived experience of, of the people we work with uh, need to be elevated and need to be transformed uh, into input for both decision making and policy making. And you have a, such a critical role to play there uh, with us, right? It's almost a translation process because that's not what we are used to. But 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 we need you and us to think together. I love I love what uh, Sajini said. Think together. 
uh, develop together and then co-author together because part of the work we do is also elevate those voices and uh, use our privileges and our legitimacy to, to lend that um, to a movement that oftentimes is, uh, even though I, I said and I fully believe is one of the most, the movements with the, the biggest transformative power, um, it's also one of the most marginalized. It's very easy to pull issues out of the agenda in light of uh, advances on, of other pieces. And so we experience this, this all the time, right? I think you also have a, um, uh, land to, uh, hand to lend to us. We 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 often fight uh, against, uh, and I and I think um, uh, Sashini covered a bit of this. You know, we cooperation assistance, the way countries provide uh, support to other countries, governments provide support to other governments. Um, it's highly um, colonial, I would say, um, defined by averages, right? So many of our countries are middle income countries, therefore. Well, you, you know this because you're economists, uh, averages um, really mask huge inequalities. Uh, some of the countries that do this, some of the governments that do this, um, are our friends, are, are those with the feminist foreign policy. So we need, we need a much more nuanced approach. You are critical in helping us uh, not just find the data and cover the data and cover the stories that show why uh, supporting progress in sexual and reproductive health and rights in bodily autonomy with that framing is actually detrimental. And, uh, and what would be different ways in which this could be done, uh, looking at human rights violations, looking at lack of access, looking at... So I, I feel there are many entry points. And the last one I, I, I mentioned because I, I think it's just so in front of us. I don't know if you experienced this, but I, I, coming out of COVID, I feel we learn nothing. So uh, or we forgot everything we have learned in every prior uh, pandemic, and we are equally unprepared, if not worse, for whatever next comes. So I think we, we there have an opportunity to come together. Why, why are women's issues or, um, or, or these issues in particular, those related to bodily autonomy, um, the ones that have been affected so gravely? Uh, in countries where we have made progress in laws and policies, where we had regulations in place, where we had actually government supporting, why is that access to contraception had uh, gone back? Why is that? Uh, so so I, I feel there is there a lot of um, work to be done together uh, because I suspect um, these systems of oppressions are at play. And as we see in the United States and we see everywhere, the, the, the conversation around rights and bodily autonomy in particular is one that is a, one in constant dispute. You think you have won, you think, you, you know, we have done work for so many years, we have the green way, we have laws, policies. For the first time, we learn how to follow money. We learn how to follow money. There is money behind programs. There is COVID and that's it. There is no more money, like as if nothing had happened. So I think there is there more to be, yeah, to be explored together. Great, thank you. Um, and there's like very little that economist wants to hear more than we have too much data. So that was a very good note. Um, but yeah, I hear you. I, these these are important lessons um, that we need to think about research going forward um, and the lessons that we've just learned. Uh, and then so Siva, I also wanna ask you um, before we open it up, um, the role of economists in this. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, some of this, um, uh, you know, approaches that um, we're talking about, you know, like, for example, the decriminalization approach, I think that, you know, showing the number of, um, you know, or calculating, you know, the number of, um, you know, unintended pregnancies, as well as how it will actually open up, you know, um, access uh, to so many more if we utilize a decriminalization approach versus to how much access is there now, right? Um, I think that that could be a measure uh, that can be used uh, by, uh, let's say, policymakers to actually kind of uh, look through all of the laws and adopt a decriminalized approach, right? I mean, like, so I think that there's all these, like, different, you know, pieces of work, like kind of that need to come together. I mean, so that's uh, off the top of my head, what I can think of. Um, secondly, I think that a lot of attention has been given to like, you know, uh, I don't know, the, how do I say, the uh, climate change uh, discourse around the science, right? So all the calculation is about science and temperature and 
<laughs> you know, how many, you know, uh, CC, uh, I mean, how many degrees Celsius we need to like reduce and who's going to reduce what type of fuel in the air, but not enough calculation has been done around uh, people. Right. So climate change uh, is not a science issue alone. It's a people issue. And, you know, if we can have like measurements around that, that kind of really, really helps like articulate and make that change. Right. Whether it's the loss of biodiversity approach that you want to use, whether it's about empowerment and rights issues or whether it's about, you know, uh, richness of ecosystems and culture. I mean, like, so there, there are all these uh, different work to be done. Um, I think uh, for the longest time, I mean, I myself had a kind of a resistant to an economic approach, really, because, you know, sometimes when you come to like uh, things like contraception and abortion, I mean, for us as activists, we are very often seeing it as a well, people should have that right, isn't it, you know? Uh, but uh, we do know that, uh, you know, kind of making that economic argument becomes increasingly powerful, um, especially with uh, ministries of finance, you know? So, uh, and I feel like a lot of that is not really available. I mean, even early age marriage, I mean, either the word, I mean, like it is not convincingly done enough, which I feel like maybe economists can actually contribute a different sort of perspective to what we have so that we actually embolden us. Um, and I think that one particular thing that, you know, I mean, uh, uh, to carry on, like from what Sachini said about UHC, right, uh, in universal health coverage, and um, especially, okay, maybe also try to reframe it as universal access, and what those two different approaches mean, you know, both in uh, 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 who they can reach and who can access it, I think, and that economic argument is something that really, you know, still remains to be made. And within the UHC, you know, rather than like leaving governments to decide what should be in that basic package, you know, a recommendation of how all of the, uh, the essential SRH services, including, you know, access to safe abortion as a critical service, and, you know, uh, you know, costing it and putting it within every UHC package uh, across the world is also something that is like, you know, I think crucial and that needs to be done. So those are some of my thoughts, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and so I do want to give a chance uh, for the audience to chime in. Um, as a reminder, uh, people can use the raise hand function and I will call on people. Um, if you have any comments or materials you want to share, you can drop those in the chat. Um, and then please, and you can also, if you want to put a question in the chat, I can read it out loud for you. Um, so I'll give people a few seconds um, if anyone wants to raise their hand and chime in in this conversation. And I can keep going with questions if um, people aren't ready to chime in yet. Okay, while people are um, doing that, um, I'll ask uh, one of the questions um, that I was thinking through, and, and, and you might just tell me this is not relevant to the context you're working in, but in the United States, at least there's been this effort of like companies to take a stand in corporations. And I think we also sort of know broadly that like corporations are, they've always been huge economic actors, but as they've gotten larger, um, as they dominate these global value chains, they've taken a, an even greater role in um, sort of mediating our institutions of society. Um, and so my question is sort of, you know, basically, you know, reproductive justice versus capitalists. Um, do capitalists or do corporations care about reproductive rights and how, um, and what are the roles of corporations in this reproductive justice movement? And I will, I mean, I can call on each, if anyone has something that they they, they know what they wanna say, um, I, I encourage you to chime in. Otherwise, um, I, will, I will call on folks. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it is quite unique uh, U.S. situation where corporations have personhood and that per that person entity of that corporation has rights equivalent to the actual people working in the corporation. So mm -hmm. <laughs> this is like uh, yeah, and this is something that uh, I, I think is uh, quite uh, unique. But definitely, I mean, across my, my, I mean, even in the country that I come from, definitely CEOs think that you know, what packages and what services and what staff can do, you know, uh, are very much dependent on their religious ideology, right? You know, so we have like, although we may have um, a kind of 
flexible abortion law, hospital administrators often like say, okay, well, I'm going to give it or I'm not going to give it depending on their own personal bias, right? So uh, I think that that's um, uh, our situation. I think in that, I think the workers' rights is something that uh, is one of those core things that need to be, so regardless of what the personal bias of the corporation shareholders or management is, that you know, uh, workers who need sexual and reproductive health services need to be able to avail of themselves, uh, avail of these services, because uh, essentially, especially for you know, uh, uh, pregnant persons and women, I mean, like these are essential, right, in order to correct gender discrimination that occurs, right? I mean, like, so to not provide those services would prove to be gender discrimination. You know, so uh, uh, I mean, that would be my my you know uh, opinion on that. Actually, anything to add, Giselle? Yes, I I want to agree. I think it's it's quite unique to to the U.S. and I it it's um, I feel uh, positive about seeing you know as, as as the change happening in Roy versus Wade to see uh, because it's an indication of social norm change in a country, right? That uh, people and organizations, institutions uh, feel the need to express themselves uh, clearly uh, about some of these uh, some of these issues, right? Um, I I was uh, reflecting that I think it's, it's quite unique to the U.S. I think it's it's positive, and I think generally what I see in other places where where we work is much harder for the for the issues of sexual and reproductive health uh, and justice, right? Um, and um, and we have not been able to make a lot of progress. I mean, there are so many other spaces uh, in which people can support that are not very political and not incredibly, um, you know, debated in, in a society that um, this is, is not uh, particularly attractive. And, and when it comes to resources, we, we are very careful about that. We oftentimes receive, you know, um, perhaps, um, interest of support from uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies or like we, we try to stay away from it uh, because one has to always look at what are those interests that those organizations, those industries are trying to advance and whether we have a clear alignment, right? Um, so I, I just, um, I, I don't know, I just, I, I was uh, trying to think is this unique to the US and could it be positive? It could be very positive uh, and and um, and I haven't seen it happening uh, so strongly as as I've seen it in the U.S. Uh, very recently. So it's something to me to observe and analyze uh, and analyze further. Thank you, and Sachini, did you have anything to add as well? Yeah, sure. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, um, I think you were referring to like, you know, like companies like Amazon who were saying we will now pay for our employees to go get their abortions, right? Which mm -hmm. I, you know, like was um, very strange given how Amazon, you know, treats their workers in their warehouses. But um, it was a very, you know, like a specific response to like, it's also connected to the media and the way these discourses are shaped, right? And wanting to kind of be part of that conversation. Um, and I think there, is, there are two ways to look at it. I mean, one is a very pragmatic thing of, you know, there are needs and there are, you know, like the practical and material uh, needs and, you know, how, how would uh, workers get access to this? And then I think politically, when we think about this, I mean, I also like think a lot about the history of menstrual products, right? Like the kind of products that we use now were introduced because uh, women needed to be better workers and, you know, like needed to spend more time in factory floors. And because of that more efficient uh, menstruation, like products were introduced and then the actual, like, you know, like um, the connections to the ecology, to our environment and like, you know, all of that between our bodies, like that piece kind of got taken away because if you acknowledge that piece, you, you know, really can't uh, make the best use of your workers. So I think I think about this a little bit in the same way, because again, you are offering this one for like your image, but also because you want your workers to fall in line, you know, like um, as soon as possible and to manage this. And I think a few things to like 
ask about actually operationalizing this is one, the privacy and confidentiality aspect of this, right? Like how would they actually manage this? Like, you know, because if a company is paying for this, there would be a trail of money. And like, I think there are just very practical questions to ask about how, like this brand statement, how does that get operationalized? But then I think on the other hand, these, what is the role of the state then? And a lot of these companies are also subsidized by the state. So it's also a bit of a, like, you know, like, um, especially if you look at the Silicon Valley companies who were really leading the charge on this, they are heavily subsidized by the state. And uh, then again, you know, like they are kind of, you know, saying for this one particular thing, we will uh, uh, handle it. But even if you looked at abortion before, uh, even before the overturning of the decision, it cost money, like, you know, like it wasn't free for people uh, even back then. So I think it's also like talking about access for a very limited group who were already getting that access due to economic or race privilege, uh, class privilege. And then you're like kind of trying to just give them that same thing. And then I think there's a question about uh, worker organizing and uh, workers' rights. So I think this again connects, right? Like, because what we have seen historically and we see it more and more which is that if the focus is on the profit margin which means uh, as much as possible companies and capital at large expects the workers to self-manage these costs and you know like these services that they need and so worker organizing is crucial to this and has been happening, you know, like for, I mean, like in Sri Lanka, the feminist movement can talk about our roots in the worker organizing. So I think it's very much, you know, has always been there. Um, but I think moving forward, it's also about how to, like, you know, what I said earlier about um, like production and uh, spaces of production and social reproduction and really also looking at you know what happens when someone leaves the workplace because that work and uh, those uh, like you know the uh, the kind of like um, uh, care work that they have to perform has no value does not get acknowledged but you're supposed to manage it and then be a good worker so i think it's also important to make those connections so that uh, we are also not talking about this only in the limitations of uh, work uh, in a formal way. Thanks. Oh, great, thank you. And yeah, Kim, your question was very well queued up as sort of the the, the opposing side of the question about corporations. Um, and so I'll read it out loud and, and let the other two speakers speak to this as well. Um, if you can just discuss the role of worker organizing you know, through unions, worker centers, other movements that are worker-based, um, increasing access to healthcare and sexual and reproductive health. Um, and Siva, do you wanna start? Yeah, um, I mean, the one of the things that I can actually uh, uh, think of is, of course, um, ensuring maternity leave, right? So we do know of cases where uh, women uh, workers were discriminated based on pregnancy status, um, and uh, unions were able to successfully kind of take the corporation to task in order to kind of, you know, modify or strengthen, you know, uh, the ask for that. So I think that that's one of the examples um, uh, uh, I can think of. So um, as always, I mean, I think um, these are all like gains that are, you know, very targeted. You know, so, uh, you know, one particular uh, union may only be able to work on one or two issues, you know, in almost like a cycle of 10 years or so, you know, because um, some of these uh, organizing um, kind of uh, takes a legal approach and legal approaches almost take like seven years, 10 years uh, to get anywhere. So, yeah, so that's one of the things that came off the top of my head. Great. And Giselle? Yes, I, I'm, I was reading at the questions and thinking I mix them up in my head somehow. But um, I, I thought the, you know, like I was trying to think of the unions in particular, the workers organizations have been instrumental in advancing the abortion law reform process in Argentina and in many of the countries in, in where we work. But that's the most recent example that I that um, their voice has been incredibly important and it's hard to say the union workers because you know it's there are many not all of them are 
progressive and not all of them, but generally as a, as a voice has been central and central to make this connection, how the issues of bodily autonomy are actually an issue of both economic and social justice, right? They, they spoke loud and clear, they marched with us, they were present all, all along. So I think, um, I think that's, uh, that, that voice is critically important and will be continued to be as we think of, of the access or the lack of access, you know, and, and, and I think we hope to, to count on, on them. Um, and I was trying to think of Nana's questions about, uh, I have no idea why our issues are fragmented, but um, we uh, suffer from fragmentation. <laughs> Uh, and yes, part of it, I think, is the funding, um, the funding sources, the funding schemes. You know, the minute you step out and you begin looking at access to water as a critical element, uh, in, for instance, uh, relationship with bodily autonomy and access to to sexual and reproductive rights, there is a donor that tells you, hey, 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 you have we are out of your focus, and you know how this is. So I, I think that's that's a. a, a that's an element that is an inertia that one cannot uh, ignore. Um, but I was also thinking whether, and I think you are best to answer this question, whether it's also because, uh, and this is my imagination, that in, in the field of economics, like we were talking before about the data, and I was thinking a lot about this question, right? Uh, are, are, are you fighting the fights internally in your movement to make these issues priority issues? Uh, and uh, and that's a, a, a fight of decolonializing. It's a fight of resignifying. It's a fight of creating a space. It's a fight about um, looking at other alternative sources of data as valid data as it's, it's a fight against patriarchy as well, you know, uh, as much as it is ours. So I, I wonder uh, whether that also has, has an impact you know, in us fighting our internal fights and, and oftentimes not uh, coming together enough, you know, from, from the get go as we are doing now to explore what are the issues that is worth researching or what are the issues that are worth um, raising our voices around uh, together. Uh, and I think if anything more, there is a need for more of these spaces of political dialogue really where we can come together to define together our agendas, right? Not just see the connections. I think the connections are clear and so, so clear that we oftentimes just uh, make, don't make them explicit. Um, but you talk to people who have money, who, <laughs> you are the money people who talk to people who have money and power over money, who will not ever give us an appointment. I mean, we have the hardest time for us is to sit down with a minister of finance or treasury department of like to talk about how these connections happen, what it means when a policy, you know, the best we have been able to do. And I think the, the feminist organizations all around the world have been uh, the strongest in holding governments to account uh, constantly, uh, including on the money. Um, uh, and the best we have been able to achieve was to really um, learn how to do that and to use uh, access to information laws to get access on resources, to get knowledge on resources we can use to shape our advocacy agendas. Um, so there is the other part of the equations that I think you hold and, and I, that's why I feel so hopeful about coming together in, in different ways to, to actually make things happen. Great, thank you, um, Giselle. And yeah, I mean, I think you know the folks still in this room probably would have all different answers about what are, what what, are the, what is the role of economists and how do they partner with you all? Because um, someone had said something too about like the role of collaborating with economists sort of is a good translational tool. And I think that sort of touches on what you were just saying, Giselle, too, is that economists are the ones who are in rooms of finance ministers and policymakers, and economics is the language of power. Um, the tricky thing is sort of with economics as a diverse and pluralistic field, and of course the economists with the greatest voice and who are in those meetings most often are precisely the ones who probably aren't considering this. And, you know, my feminist economics colleagues are very well aware that when you explicitly define your work as feminist, when you focus on gender, um, not only as a unit of analysis, but as a perspective that you bring to economics research and a perspective that needs to be taken into account, 
um, you are often then marginalized within the field as well, and, and you lose the power of that voice of economics. And so it, it's a tricky balance to figure out. Um, but I think that probably just in practice means it takes all kinds. It takes radical feminist economists um, doing work, uh, probably able to do more, more collaboratively and in depth with you, as well as folks who are maybe, you know, more subtly moving the needle from within these institutions. And so it just takes all those types of economists to do that work. Um, and I'm sure everyone here would have a different answer than me, but I think that's a really good call to arms. Um, and so I'll ask one last audience question to sort of end on a positive note. Um, Daisy Jean Renaud asked uh, if you can share some key wins in getting states or international organizations to recognize the relationship between reproductive justice and economic justice. And I really like this question too, because I think part of why I was so excited about this event is that um, things just feel very dire in the United States right now. Um, advocates and researchers who focus on the US are really you know, thinking about how can we prepare for a national ban being introduced? How can we prepare for additional attacks? But there are also wins that are happening, um, perhaps you know, within some US states, but also globally, there are wins, there are expansions um, to reproductive healthcare access. Um, there are a greater recognition of reproductive justice as a com uh, concept. Um, in the sort of the development space. Um, and so are there some key wins that you can share um, to sort of leave things as not only on a positive note, it's not just to make us feel better at the end of this, but also just to help us figure out how do we move forward from here? Um, what was an example of something that worked that we can follow? Um, so I will first uh, have um, Sachini and then Siva and then Giselle on that way. Um, thanks, Kate. Um, wins, um, which is also very context specific. Um, but um, I think I'll talk about unpaid care work a bit more and some of the, you know, like small strides that are being made. Um, for an example, like I, I think in Asia Pacific in the last few years, we have seen more time use surveys happening uh, at national level. Uh, Sri Lanka had a first time use survey like about two years ago. And we know this is a methodology and like the resources needed for this has very much been something that has been concentrated in the global north. And I think just the fact that the, the, the national statistical uh, institutions are starting to acknowledge this and bring that into the fold has been really important because this is exactly what we've been talking about. We need more data, but where and how can resources be uh, put into this? And I think the challenge really is that um, to really integrate this uh, rather than it being a one-off exercise. But I think it's been very encouraging to see that measurements like that are coming into play. But I think the piece that is missing is that feminist groups have been also doing time use surveys for a long time. And there are very interesting methodologies that, you know, emerge there, you know, like sometimes we just ask someone like, you know, like we tell them to uh, tell us, you know, what the uh, categories are rather than, you know, like imposing categories. And those can bring out very interesting uh, results. But I think putting resources towards things like that are really important. Um, and then I think even in terms of um, unpaid care work, we saw that the SDGs became one of the first frameworks like for all its limitations, which we know and challenges, which we all know about, but it has an in indicator around unpaid care work, which we haven't really seen emerge in uh, many other instruments. And that is again, a really important acknowledgement that and I think, you know, if we talk about the in the language of social reproduction, we can talk about this much more broadly, because when we talk about unpaid care work, the assumption is that, oh, it should now be paid. But I think we are talking about something uh, like very different. We're talking about very culturally specific, uh, geographically specific ways of being families, of taking care of each other, of looking after our health and well-being and our bodies. So really talking about that in that broader way is important but i think this is still progress that this is these kinds of indicators are there um yeah thanks great thank you and siva you are on mute, on mute. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, and I think, uh, well, I, uh, in Malaysia, um, definitely, I mean, I would think that they also took a leave from maybe Sri Lanka in uh, the care work. Uh, because um, they actually kind of um, introduce a scheme uh, uh, for, unfortunately, what it's like, uh, what we call housewives. I mean, basically women who are unemployed and do work at home, right? Um, and this was social security and that the government would uh, actually provide a very small amount and asking, you know, husbands to kind of contribute social security for their wives, you know, in an older age group. Um, they also kind of changed the um, social protection, right? So uh, we are given social protection under, uh, yeah, is a scheme that's called SOXO, which all workers are able to contribute to. And they actually have opened up that contribution to uh, women who do care work or care, I mean, like who are working in the home. So they can make contributions. So if they uh, have, and they've defined the work, I think this is part of the pandemic, the, that the site of work can be home, right? Uh, so uh, uh, then these um, women who work in the house are able to actually avail themselves of these benefits of like disability, health, and social security in the long run. So I think that that's one uh, win that we can look at. Um, but I also wanted to like kind of touch on Nana's thing. I think we're all too a little bit hard on ourselves and we say, why aren't we working together? You know, I mean, working in SRHR is hard enough because, you know, or when we talk about services, we have to talk about to Ministry of Health. Where if we talk to about comprehensive sexuality education, we have to talk about MOE. If we want to talk about universal health coverage or financing for this, we'll have to talk to the Ministry of Finance, right? So I feel like some of these structures are deliberately used to divide us uh, and make us scramble all over the place in order for us to get a holistic solution. And I think that, you know, part of that, you know, uh, I guess resistance from us is actually to work together in order to say this is a common agenda and we divide our roles amongst ourselves, but we speak the same language and have the same asks, you know. So I think the system, you know, the disconnect is created for us. You know, it's not we created the disconnect. Great, thank you. Um, and I apologize to give you less time, Giselle, but we are at time. So I want to give you a chance to respond, um, but also encourage you to do so briefly if you can. Very briefly, thank you very much. Uh, I, I I was reading just now some data about the fact that women's rights organizations and the women's rights issues are the least uh, supported, the least funded. And there is some other data that shows that during the pandemic, uh, we were hit the hardest uh, with less flexibility in the funding, no? Um, so I, I think there is something to be said about the way things uh, are uh, funded and supported. I, th I believe um, we are making great progress. I, I believe these issues are incredibly hard, but as I said, the, the feminist movement everywhere is making incredible progress in advancing rights, in resisting the most oppressive um, uh, systems on earth, uh, if, if not to look at the Iranian women. Um, and, and I just uh, believe that uh, we have so much uh, more to do together, right? So as I said at the beginning, I hope this is uh, the beginning of our conversations. I think the situation in the US is incredibly hard and like any country, the US will have to figure out um, what worked best. And I know that's, um, that's, that's hard, uh, but I want uh, all of you that are uh, here to know that uh, the feminist movement is stands in solidarity, is ready to support, is ready to, to be together, you know, to think collectively, to, to really come together to share our strategies, to share what is useful, to embrace each other. Because when we have nothing else and when things get really, really tough, um, we have each other. And um, and I I wanted to leave you all with with that, you know. And thank you very much for creating this opportunity. And thank you both to the wonderful co-speakers Siva and Sachini for uh, for really sharing their thoughts and and uh, intelligence and heart in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a beautiful note to end on, and I and I'm I'm not inclined to add too much to it, other than again thank you, thanking our, our three speakers, Giselle, Sachini, Siva. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your energy and your thoughts. Um, we really this is invaluable to IAFI's members. Um, so I really really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and thank you to our really engaged audience as well. 
we will, we are recording this, we will be able to share it with members um, in this again, as part of, you know, this is the beginning of a conversation. And so um, everyone, please keep an eye out for future event announcements on this topic. Um, and thank you again. I appreciate your time so much.